Hello and welcome back. Um, our next topic is by Selena Agaton on pandemic and climate recovery through phosphagy local knowledge, stewardship and employment models. Selena helps regenerate supply chains to support governance, gender and MSMEs. She leads projects for World Bank, ADB and APAC Canada. She is the founder and managing director of MAP PH or Philippines, executive director of the Creative Economy Council of the Philippines and chair of OSG Oceania Outreach and Communications. Her talk is pre-recorded, but she will be joining us for a live Q&A. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and uh, we will be able to ask them, ask Selena at the end of her talk. Hello, my name is Selena Agaton. The year 2020 was also a year of 2020 vision. We have perfect clarity and open acknowledgement of who our local and international institutions choose to serve. Today, I'll be sharing with you some of the fundamental flaws that the Open Knowledge Kit Regeneration Program helps address through local knowledge stewardship, local data collection and mapping using free and open source uh, tools, all while creating new models of highly skilled, safe and remote employment for marginalized communities. We, may, uh, we mainly try to address four key issues. The first being that the research and policy model is broken. Data collection is often completed by outsiders and foreigners in the most vulnerable communities. These people often lack local knowledge or respect for the local communities and see the work as just a contract. Research and programs are often very short term, consisting of workshops that lack true impact in the community, nor reflecting the long term needs. Projects are often not coordinated across the sectors resulting in overlaps and duplication, but more importantly, gaps in the marginalized communities that have no social and political capital. The pandemic has revealed these structural flaws, and I would argue that it's the same institutions and the lack of a viable implementation program that has effectively institutionalized generational poverty and corruption. Secondly, with technology, many technology projects, software and tools are very expensive, not built with a local community's use or capacity in mind and complicated to learn and use, often with inadequate funding to support its long-term use or adoption in communities. While funders are only too eager to invest in new technology and new innovations, here we are decades later still talking about the digital divide the lack of internet access, local roads, clean water, food insecurity, health clinics, and now vaccines. Third, we lack good jobs. We have to recognize for centuries, communities had no agency in their search for meaningful and productive work with fair wages. 2021 marks the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Magellan and subsequent colonizers in Asia Pacific. This has led to the global uh, scaling of the slave trade, labor and resource exploitation and migration, patterns that remain unchanged until today. Lastly, we need to discuss the gender gap. The fourth challenge continues to leave women absent or invisible in the planning, research, and implementation of uh, policies and programs. While my gender gap mapping research showed that women were traveling the longest distances more often with more expensive transportation costs, all while bringing in multiple incomes, sometimes more than the men, they were also responsible for the lion's share of household health and schooling tasks, 
And all this while they have the least access to basic infrastructure, such as clean water and paved roads, training, processing facilities, safe and affordable transportation, loans, and credit. Everything you would need to succeed. It's simply not enough to, ca to count the attendance of females at events. We need local real-time data to reflect the vast contributions of women and their communities that largely go unpaid. Women in many uh, countries represent the majority of micro, small, and medium enterprise. And it's these MSMEs that also reflect the majority of the economy in many of these countries. So if women are holding up both the economy and the household, then effective pandemic relief and recovery programs cannot exist without reflecting the central role of women in the social, economic, and climate prosperity of their communities. The Open Knowledge Kit, or OK Kit, is a free and open source toolkit and employment regeneration program empowered by local women with digital employment and the stewardship of the economic climate and social prosperity of their communities. It's free, open source, offline, and easy to learn with local stewardship at the center of it. Most local data collection is led by women and includes industry leading 3D reconstruction photogrammetry technology that achieves 95% of the accuracy of LIDAR, which is very expensive and often what's used in disaster and climate change modeling. The use of 3D reconstruction technology creates accurate geospatially referenced data, or what's called digital twins, to be used in land titles, disaster and climate change models, transportation and logistics planning and validation, and infrastructure planning and monitoring. These are the three tools that we've created. These are free and open source software that powers industry-leading 3D reconstruction processing. The first is 3D Street View for street-level data collection. The next level up is 360 Libre. And then we have Open Drone Map. As you can see, our hardware costs are either free or much lower compared to industry standards. And the software cost, our software cost is zero. So here's how it works. The first step is using Open Data Kit. It's a free and open source data collection tool that we can train someone how to use in less than an hour. It can work on any smartphone and also works without internet. Throughout the pandemic, I've been training indigenous and remote women in different countries. This is an example. So Diohana is a Tedurai indigenous mother from the conflict region of the Philippines. And using Facebook Messenger video, I trained her in 20 minutes how to take 12 photos in a clock-like fashion facing different directions and at three different angles to be able to do a 3D reconstruction. We use Facebook Messenger because it's the only means of communication in many communities. And with the pandemic, most people cannot afford internet access. In her first trial, Diohana completed one 360 set in two and a half minutes, and then took photos every two meters over a 40 meter road segment. So this video just shows her taking photos in a circle. And this is the completed 3D reconstruction. Thanks, Carol. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, the product of Diohana's very first try in taking the photos. And using our 3D Street View technology, we've been able to piece together uh, this 3D reconstruction. So you can see that the resolution and the clarity is really incredible. 
And because this is photogrammetry, we can actually extract data from this. So you can see that the roads are of poor condition. We can measure the width of the road and the depth of the, the potholes and make quite um, detailed assessments um, as if you were there. So this is actually built on the Unity platform now, so you can navigate the space as you wish. So if you go to 3dstreetview.org, you can select any one of our um, pilot sites there and have a look around. Um, we're moving toward a process of um, gamification as well with this, where women can be employed and other people can be employed to actually tag the features that you see here that can then be um, extracted and imported into OpenStreetMap. So just to show you um, the level of validation that you can do here, uh, even for construction where you can validate, uh, there were bags of cement at some point in this video. So uh, it just provides a much better realization um, and it's a powerful visual tool to actually show the true conditions that are going on in community. So um, thanks, Carol. I think we can go back to the recording. So next we have 360 Libre. This is um, using Raspberry Pi cameras um, to be able to fast track the volume of photos that are taken. And this can be taught um, in two days. So the first day to learn how to collect the photos and the second day and how to process them. Lastly, we have Open Drone Map, which is really the software that powers all these three tools. As I mentioned before, it has a 95% accuracy of LIDAR that's used in climate change and disaster, disaster risk modeling, which is delayed in so many countries. And it also installs on any drone model. It's also lightweight. And this we can also teach in, in two days. So as part of our local training program, we also teach communities how to use OpenStreetMap's free and open source map editing platform. There are over 7 million global users, and you could see um, the many familiar logos that use OpenStreetMap. There are also six different free satellite image resources for remote mapping and validation. And the mapping tasks that we can train on um, can vary from just one minute, uh, 30 minutes, or up to the two to three day um, remote mapping workshop that we've taught in non-technical people um, in, uh, a ranging in a ranging in age from six years old to 60 plus. So we really focus on people with the interest and capacity to map rather than asking them if they have technical capabilities. Next, uh, we also teach as part of this two to three day workshop, um, QGIS to be able to do, to do the big data analytics and again, free and open source software. These are our founding organizations uh, across different countries. And um, these are some of the projects. So for this particular World Bank project, um, it was combining several research studies all in one to show that we can actually create a model that is faster, low tech, um, but produces uh, local employment, uh, more accurate data and data that can be easily validated. So with this, we had the Gender Gap Mapping Project, the Rural Agriculture, Transportation and Logistics Mapping and Prioritization Project, and we also trained 180 um, cross-sector mappers. This was across six provinces um, where my team was 200 people, where uh, out of those 200, 180 of them were actually local staff. So um, this is very helpful in doing the field surveys um, and having familiar faces in the community. And again, also reduces the travel costs associated with um, the local, uh, with bringing in people that are outsiders or expats. So with the lack of travel expense or reduced travel expense, 
we then pass those savings down into the community. So um, for the survey data collectors as an example, and minimum wage in the Philippines is $5 a day, we were able to pay them 25 to $40 a day plus insurance. So I tend to purchase as much insurance as the project um, can afford. Uh, this is our parallel team as well in Tanzania. Um, they're a team of about 50 now actually working on um, several projects for World Bank and funded by Botnar um, Foundation. Now I'm going to discuss the immediate opportunities for scaling and impact, showing that we have this new model and with the pandemic, an opportunity to leverage the current travel restrictions where we can actually implement this and teach local communities how to do their own um, data collection, monitoring, evaluation, all while providing them with a much higher income than they otherwise would have been earning, or especially now during the pandemic is, is zero or significantly reduced. So for women, um, we do find that women really excel in the mapping and data collection, um, partly because this reflects the role in life where they're responsible for so many tasks and are often um, not asked um, what, you know, their, for their input and, and programs and policies. And so in our training workshops, I actually separate the men and women now um, because we find that the results, I mean, women are constantly and consistently consistently producing such high results and usually above and beyond the tasks that we ask them for these workshops. Um, so this is a tremendous opportunity to be able to train the women to be the community um, knowledge stewards and to be that central, um, that central point of knowledge where they can better coordinate multiple overlapping initiatives in, in their community. Next is um, road safety. So the International Road Assessment Program is a great program that makes very technical assessments per 100 meters on the design of a road and also how to address those specific um, safety issues in very detailed um, assessments from a long-term and short-term perspective um, that's specifically scaled to the local community's budget. So the opportunity with this is that the data needs to be collected and assessed every 100 meters. So that's a tremendous amount of employment that can be provided to communities and particularly because the work is outdoors, it can be completed safely and remotely. I actually just remotely finished a World Bank project in the Philippines where we had to do um, technical surveys on traffic flow and speed, where typically you would bring in an outsider or foreign group to bring in their very expensive, it's usually about $200 for a speed radar gun and another maybe $20 for um, the counter clickers for counting the number of vehicles. And so we've created this very low cost, very low tech model that only requires uh, Coke, or we use Coca-Cola bottles, but any soft drink, any colored type of bottle, uh, the one liter bottles that can be visible from a, a, a video recording, um, and their smartphone. So we were just looking for objects that could be uh, affordable or available and easily seen in a, a, a smartphone recording. So for this, as you can see on the left and right, um, you can see the bottles and you can see the chairs that were used to be able to serve as markers for measuring velocity of traffic and then also counting um, the number of vehicles, both motorized, non-motorized, as well as pedestrians. So because we're using video, this can be highly validated. Um, the, the same video is also what's used to uh, encode the speeds of the vehicles and also to count the number of, of folks. And for this, I paid the, the local data collectors who I'd actually never met and trained them um, on Facebook Messenger again. So for an hour of video that they had to record plus setup, so we can say it was usually up, up to an hour, so two hours of work, um, and I paid them 50 to $100 for that work. And also because the budget could afford it, 
even though it was only two hours of work, I actually paid for a month of insurance for them and that covered travel, medical and liability insurance. So this shows you um, one of the examples of how we've created a very low, low tech, low cost model um, while being able to increase the level of data accuracy and validation. Next, we also work with ICCAs, which are the Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas. So, so many countries, so many communities, um, whether it's budgetary or political reasons, um, have had many challenges in being able to complete disaster risk and climate change modeling in their communities. So now we show a way using Open Drone Map and the different tools to be able to fast track um, the completion of this disaster and climate change modeling. And not only that, it can also be done discreetly using a drone. So again, it drastically reduces the time, the, the cost, while also providing that employment opportunity to that local community. Now, this is um, the other industries that we support because the mapping and data collection really helps inform all the other economies that we can help regenerate. So from the creative industries, working with artisans all the way through to visual performing arts, the whole art spectrum, um, graphic designers, etc., we're shaping how communities are able to strengthen their capacity by providing them with deep discounts, with product development, branding support, et cetera, um, and connecting them to more premium and ethical clients. This also includes uh, our tourism and hospitality program. Next, it's also with agriculture and food security, working with smallholder farmers and mostly women farmers on, again, sustainable farming practice with market access to ethical and premium buyers, while also reviving heritage and heirloom species that can be of value to local tourism, as well as international tourism initiatives. And this is working with one of the world's top luxury hospitality trainers to really help elevate the local skill level in different communities, but also to be able to shape um, the employers to be employers that are respectful and pay fair wages, both internationally and abroad. And working with more um, small scale um, uh, luxury retreat, executive retreat folks, smaller groups that are looking for culture like Traveling Spoon that are more in line with the capacity of the local community while also being very respectful of the local practice. So that um, in a nutshell is my presentation. Um, you know, the main concern with the pandemic now is that with so many organizations and people losing funding that once again, it will be the big multinational organizations that are making these decisions that don't necessarily have the community's well-being um, in mind. So this is our goal and um, we've been able to show that we can operate remotely working um, in Indigenous Canada, um, in, um, in Asia Pacific um, and in, in Africa as well, using this model and training people remotely and very quickly. So we hope um, we can connect um, with more allies um, and also stay tuned for our event, as I mentioned, celebrating the 500th uh, anniversary of the arrival of Magellan and other colonizers, where we'll be sharing uh, micro grant and grant opportunities on how to showcase this mapping visualization data. We hope to produce some art as well and really highlight um, this very complex and yet hidden history of our global economies and how FOSS4G can actually lead the way forward in a more equitable um, and gender equitable future. So thank you. Thank you so much, Selena. Um, I think maybe we could just move straight into questions. Um, there is one that you've already kind of answered in your presentation. 
Um, well, they asked, how did you motivate and engage community members to take part in the project or mapping? Is there some kind of recognition, compensation, or appreciation to the communities? Um, for Well, for the basic mapping workshops, we simply uh, taught them how to map. And part of the engagement process, again, is explaining the value of mapping, because typically, if I were to approach a community and I started describing um, the mapping workshop, they would immediately think about um, inviting engineers and computer science students. So that's a, a whole discussion that we go through where I have to emphasize that it is on local knowledge um, and an interest and capacity to map versus whether or not they know how to use a computer. And um, particularly the women get very excited at this prospect because they have so many things to report in their community. So they are, um, the, the learners in the workshops are not compensated. And then when we are doing the data collection, however, uh, those are the, the paying jobs. And so we're um, trying to shift this model. It's a local procurement model where donors and local governments um, can shift to this policy where uh, being approached by any organization to want to fund um, research should then immediately um, initiate this, this local model so that that community can earn um, better wages, but also be able to be part of the collection process um, to make their own decisions in their communities. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Living in the world. Um, there's another question, it's quite dense. Um, do you think funded projects or programs can be sustainable or community owned? For example, even without funders, communities are able to continue and practice phosphagy knowledge, maybe with the help of local mm -hmm. organizations or government. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And actually, in my role with the Creative Economy Council of the Philippines, this is what um, I'm working to shift is that so many people um, in the creative industries, and that includes visual and performing arts, culinary, um, heritage and culture, um, and largely the informal community, those people are not registered um, for a multitude of reasons, but it makes it very difficult now in the pandemic to be able to plan um, relief or recovery programs because they don't exist, or they don't have ID to be able to receive um, government relief. And so we're in the process right now of identifying um, a model with which to do that so that um, luckily there are actually existing excellent policies that allow for registration of uh, micro to medium enterprise so that they're tax free, but they also have access to loans and credit. And this is the link um, in sustainability where the link from policy to implementation is often um, unfunded and so we have these fantastic policies with very low awareness and here we are in the pandemic so um, based on that model uh, every local government unit in the Philippines uh, which I hope becomes a requirement is that they see mapping as infrastructure and that this becomes um, a point of prioritization coordination monitoring of activities while at the same time shifting uh, local government procurement policies to, to fund these. And that way, instead of consistently asking for these very small grants or funding opportunities that are scattered um, and lack real long-term impact, we can then use mapping as a tool to really holistically integrate um, data across the SDGs and be able to plan a long-term sustainability plan um, to achieve these goals since clearly everything that's taken place over the last uh, 80 years or so since you know international donors became involved um, hasn't worked and um, the local community is available and ready to work and with the travel restrictions this is the opportunity to be able to implement that. Muted. <laughs> so muted. I was just going to say, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but it's a great discussion um, and a great job that you're doing. Um, so I hope maybe some of us will see you in the near future. I know I will. <laughs>
So thanks so much for being here, Celine. I know the time difference makes it difficult. Thanks, Carol. Thanks for the no opportunity. See you later. <laughs> Bye. Great. So um, we're moving straight into our next talk, um, which is by Benjamin Hetford. He's actually sending in, oh, we're playing a pre-recorded presentation, but he will be here to answer some questions and answers at the end of his presentation. His topic is using the OSM framework to develop an OSM confidence index to support humanitarian mapping. Benjamin is a researcher at High GIT and a doc doctoral candidate in geography at Heidelberg University, and his research and work is dealing with OpenStreetMap, map swipe, and information from social media. He's developing open source tools and methods that incorporate geographic information systems for disaster management and humanitarian aid. So, welcome, Benjamin. 